11 participants today. Hmm. This will be a tough one for them to learn on their own. But, all right. um, so we're on chapter 14, which is our kind of our HVAC chapter, but we're more just, we're learning about um, mixtures, air conditioning, so humidity, and how that plays a part and how we measure that and relate that and how does that, uh, the amount of water in the air um, change the properties and change, um, you know, the heating or cooling effect what, that we need. So that's this chapter. So a little relatable on that, on your projects too. All right, so we'll talk about, you know, we'll start describing some things that we used before. We would just say air. Well, now we'll start talking about dry air versus kind of like atmospheric air, okay? I guess I'm in red today. Um, the define, so we'll talk about some humidity. You know, relative humidity is one used, you know, every day, but in engineering, the specific humidity is what we use in calculations. Uh, dew point, we'll figure out how to get dew point, temperature, okay, and then the other one is the wet bulb temperature. So now we have these extra temperatures we'll define, okay. And then the psychometric chart, learn to use that. That's extremely useful, okay, in HVAC. All right, and then now taking these concepts and applying the conservation of mass, conservation of energy to those, to these processes of air conditioning. Okay, so let's get started on this. The atmospheric air contains some water vapor or moisture. Okay, so when we say dry air, it means there's no water vapor. Okay, um, and human comfort, we definitely have water vapor that plays a part. Okay. There's the just the right amount of water vapor that humans would like for comfort. Okay. But when we're, when we're starting to talk about properties, you should see it when in the calculations. So some of these calculations we're going to do for the first few slides. We're going to have the equations, and then the psychometric chart basically is a chart that visualizes, all, requires you not to use the equations, the chart. Okay. You can use the chart to look up the values, but the equations that they use to get there is from this. Okay, and these equations are very specific to HVAC, like this one is dry air, right? So they're just saying the enthalpy is just CPT, and they're just assuming that the CP is just gonna be this value, and the temperatures, we can just put in our temperature or CP delta T, because they really don't, when you're talking about HVAC, the range of temperatures is, is very small. So then the range of CPs is very small. So they're just like, all right, well, this is just HVAC application. So we're just gonna take 1.005 and use it, okay? It doesn't create much, fa much air for them because that's the range of temperatures they're dealing with. All right, so here is the chapter when we can finally say water vapor behaves as an ideal gas, okay? and the reason behind it is because from chapter 13, we learned about partial pressures, right? Where you can sum up the pressure of your mixture. So if you sum up air and water vapor, the partial pressure of the water vapor is very low, okay? So think like three kPa, not 100 kPa, that's this pressure, right? Like if you're thinking about atmospheric air, 100 kPa is the total pressure, dry air, is around 97 kPa of it, and then the partial pressure of the water vapor is only 3 kPa. So it's, so it's very low pressure, which is where the ideal gas is valid for water vapor, okay? Versus if you were trying to use it in steam in a uh, Rankine power plant where you're at, you could be at 10,000 kPa water vapor, right? Now that's not behaving as much like an ideal gas, but here, you know, we're in those, you know, around three kPa, you know, it changes, but I'm just showing you the level of the value. So that's why we can assume we can, that it's an ideal gas. Okay. 
So again, partial pressures, we talked about those in the last chapter, summing up the pressures, get your total pressure. Okay. All right, so this is the enthalpy of the dryer. Now the enthalpy of a simple equation for the water. Okay, again, they're dealing with a small temperature range in HVAC, negative 10 to 50, right? So if we look at negative 10 to 50 in our table, right, we take the table, we take Hg, which is the saturated vapor value at that range in the table, okay? And they basically fit an equation to it, okay? So you see this range of, of Hg at that. So then they've basically created an equation that just defines Hg. So the simplification, because they're down here in this low pressure, taking these points, right? So that they're just made a nice simple equation to relate what Hg is without looking it up in the table. Again, because we are only looking at that small temperature range. Okay, so for HVAC, they, and this is common in a lot of industries, they create equations off of property data that only applies for their, their application because they're only seeing this small range of information. Okay. okay, so now we have the enthalpy of the water vapor. Okay, we have the enthalpy of the dry air. We have the enthalpy of the water vapor. All right, well, we need to define some more parameters. So this is where we define our absolute or our specific humidity. So in engineering, this is, the, this is the great one. This is the one that tells us the most information, okay? And it's as simple as the kilograms of water vapor divided by the kilograms of dry air, okay? And that's our, our specific humidity, okay? If we wanted to, so we can have it this way, and we'll use this a lot, especially when conservation of mass, because that tells us about the relations of the mass of vapor and dry air, okay? Or we can utilize it this way if we needed to solve for it, and this is where we put in our ideal gas law, right, for the water vapor, put in the ideal gas law for the dry air, and then start canceling off, you know, temperatures being the same, volume being the same, and we get this, and we have just partial pressures right here, and we have the gas constants. And this magic number you'll see in a lot of equations, that's what comes from that, those ratios of those gas constants right there. So they just calculate it, and now you have this equation that tells us the specific humidity if you know the partial pressures. Or they take out the, par the partial pressure of the air, and just sub in the total pressure, and that's what you get right here with this simplified equation. So now all you need is the partial pressure of the water vapor and your total pressure, right? So if you had the room temperature of 100 kPa, that's this. Now we just need to get our partial pressure of the water vapor, and we would know the specific humidity or the, the ratio of masses of water vapor to dry air, okay? All right, so here's, oh, I'll wait a second. See, saturated air is the air saturated with moisture. So it's fully, so it can't hold anymore. It's saturated, okay? If the air can't hold any more moisture. It's saturated with air, okay? Or saturated with water vapor. So relative humidity. So this is the one we typically use, you know, on a daily basis, right? We say, oh, you know, the humidity is, it's, the humidity is high. We're talking about relative humidity, right? And relative humidity, and you'll see in a little bit, uh, and further slide, it deals with human comfort. We like a certain relative humidity. It's not as much of we like a certain specific humidity up here, right? That's better for our engineering calculations, but as humans, we like a certain relative humidity to feel comfortable, okay? So that's the part where relative humidity comes in, okay? So if we think about what that is, it's the amount of water vapor the air holds the amount that it's holding to the max amount that it can hold, okay, at the same temperature. So that's one key thing. As you change temperature, relative humidity changes, okay. You can not even be changing your mass, you know, your mass of water vapor in the air, but this 
what it can hold can change just with temperature. So as temperature change, relative humidity changes. Okay? Specific humidity doesn't. Okay? All right, so let's get the equation for that then. All right, so this relative humidity, okay, we have the mass of water vapor that the air is holding, okay, and then our max that it can hold at the same temperature, okay. All right, so then we put in our ideal gas law, okay, so that's what's being put in here for the water vapor and then the max water vapor, and we again cancel off the temperatures and the volumes. And it's water vapor on the numerator and denominator, so the gas constant cancels. So then we're just left with this ratio of partial pressures. So this is the actual partial pressure of the water vapor, right? Then this is the max, right? This tells us this is the pressure. This is the saturation pressure at the given temperature. Okay, so that is the maximum partial pressure at that given temperature that the water vapor can have. So by Utilizing relative humidity and just look up in the table, the saturation pressure at a given temperature, we can know what the actual partial pressure of the water vapor is, right? So if we rearrange this. So if we know it's 20 degrees Celsius, we can go look up our saturation pressure at that. We know we want. 50% it's 50% relative humidity. We put in 0.5 here, and then we have our actual calculated. We have our actual partial pressure of the water vapor. Okay, we can then use that up here if we wanted to. Okay, it's a terrible arrow. Um, all right, so some an example of kind of what goes on here. They're showing 25 degrees Celsius, 100 kPa. So at 25 degrees Celsius. We look up that saturation pressure, we get 3.1698 kPa. Right? All right, for dry air, you would have a partial pressure of the water vapor of zero. For saturated air, you would have 3.1698. A rel this would be a relative humidity of 100%. Okay, the saturated air. Okay, Uns unsaturated air would be anything below that. Dry air would be a relative humidity of 0%, okay? All right, so another kind of example, but with the specific humidity, we have 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere. They give us the mass of the dry air. Okay, so this is dry air. They give us the mass of the water vapor. Okay, and this is our max that the water vapor can hold. Max water, that the air can hold, sorry. Max water vapor. All right, so specific humidity would just be 0 0.01 divided by one. All right, so we get this kilograms H2O divided by kilograms dry air. The relative humidity is just this 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.02. Okay. All right, these two equations are just useful equations. They've basically just taken these two equations here and substituted them in one way or the other so you could go directly from one to the other. So, what I'm saying is so you, if you had relative humidity, you can get specific humidity, or if you had specific humidity, you can get relative. So that's what this is, right? So if you had specific humidity, you can get relative humidity, or if you had relative humidity, you can get specific humidity. So you don't need both. If you have one, you can basically look up the that, part, that saturation pressure at the given temperature and convert to the other, okay? So that's what those two equations are just combining uh, multiple equations from that last slide. Okay. All right. So humidity, so, or so the enthalpy, right, is one of the most important concepts for you to get because it's a little different. 
And this is where I see a lot of mistakes. In that, they take, they basically, and you'll see it here, we create an enthalpy of the atmospheric air, which has moisture. But we make it per kilogram of dry air. And the reason being, so that when we say kilojoules per kilogram, we're going to make it per kilogram of dry air, even though this kilojoules has dry air and water vapor. And the reason being is because most of the applications, we'll see when we do some um, examples in the slides too, the dry air, the amount of dry air does, does not change, it remains constant. You're typically changing the amount of water vapor. Okay? So then it's easier to just use the dry air because that's not changing, right? So if you multiply this enthalpy times the mass flow to dry air, you'll get the kilojoules versus trying to separate it out into water, dry air and water vapor. Now you have lots of things changing. Okay, so how do we get this equation then? All right, so we take the total enthalpy and we say, okay, it's the enthalpy of the dry air, right? So here's dry air plus the enthalpy of the water vapor, okay? All right, pull out mass for each, dry air times its lowercase enthalpy, um, water vapor times its lowercase enthalpy. Okay. Now we just divide this whole this equation. We in this we just divide it by the mass of dry air. We just divide this this and this by the mass of dry air, and you get lowercase enthalpy. Right. And that lowercase enthalpy is now per unit per kilogram of dry air. Right, because we have it right here. Then this enthalpy for the dry air, the mass of air cancels, and then we're left with this enthalpy of the water vapor and the ratio of mass of vapor over dry air, which happens to be our specific humidity that we just defined right here. Okay. All right. Um, so then, oh, go ahead. Um, so does our specific humidity kind of act as a quality? <laughs> so, yeah, kind of. I mean, it kind of tells it tells us the rate, right? It's a ratio of dry air or the ratio of water vapor to dry air. So it tells us how much kind of to include of that enthalpy of the vapor part into it, right? If there's no water vapor, right? If this, yeah, the, if this is zero, then you know, then this cancels out, right? So we get, then you only have dry air. Yeah, so it tells us kind of the ratio of how much to include of the water vapor in there. Okay, thank you. All right, Net. Nice distinction we have to make right now because we're going to define. Okay, so that's our enthalpy. Okay. Then distinction is we're going to define a bunch of temperatures. So the temperature we've always been using in the past, all the problems is in this chapter, it's the dry bulb temperature. So if they say dry bulb temperature, you have the dry bulb temperature. But if they just say, oh, the temperature of the air is 20 degrees Celsius, they're also talking about the dry bulb temperature. Okay, and I'll call it when I do the, the subscript in a, on a problem, I'll use DB, so dry bulb, right? Okay, and that's because there's a wet bulb temperature that we'll we'll see and a dew point temperature that we'll define. So then we got to define that temperature is normally just the dry bulb temperature. All right, so then dew point temperature. Okay, so this is our first um, defining of our new temperatures. Okay, so it is the temperature at which Condensation begins when the air is cooled at constant pressure. All right. So the the big part of it is you have to use the vapor pressure, right? So the 
partial pressure of the vapor, the vapor right? Because that's not the total pressure, right? The total pressure is P, P atmosphere plus the pressure of the vapor. So we're using that pressure of the water vapor. So if it's at, what did we have up here, 25 degrees Celsius, then you have um, 0.31698. So then that partial pressure is, you know, 0.3168. So then you have to use that pressure. You have to get the saturation temperature at that pressure of the water. Okay, so not the total pressure, but the pressure of the water. Okay. And when you basically you're taking that pressure that you're that the water is, and as you cool it, you know, you cool it down that constant pressure line, the water hits the dome and starts condensing so it, because it's hitting the dome at that pressure because you're cooling at constant pressure you hit that dome you start condensing um, liquid out and that's the dew you start seeing right so that's what happens when you see you know the moisture on the outside of a soda can you have moist air out here and it gets to the can and it's cooling down to at that same pressure, because we're just in the atmospheric air, so then the partial pressure of the water vapor is the same, and it hits the dome because that temperature of the soda is lower than the dew point temperature. All right, so here's a quick example. In cold weather, condensation frequently occurs on the inner surfaces of the windows due to the lower air temperatures near the window surface. Consider a house shown in this figure that contains air at 20 degrees Celsius and 70%, 75% relative humidity. At what window temperature will the moisture in the air start condensing on the inner surfaces of the window? Okay, so we have basically the air is at 20 degrees Celsius, so that's our dry bulb. It's 20 degrees Celsius, and our relative humidity is 75%. Okay. All right, so we have then to figure out the dew point, we need this equation, right? So first we need to figure out the partial pressure, the pressure of the water vapor, okay? And that comes from utilizing these two parameters. Okay, this is two parameters that basically tells us all the other information about this this moist air at that condition. We have dry bulb and relative humidity. That's enough to get other information. All right, so we have to use our relative humidity equation that we defined. Right, that looked like this. Right. So we use it to solve for this. So this is what we have rearranged. So we're looking for that pressure of the water vapor. So we have relative humidity. And then we have our value that is the pressure, the max pressure that the water vapor can be at at the given temperature. So at the dry bulb. So at 20 degrees Celsius, we go get our value. It's 2.3392. It's 75% relative humidity, so that means the pressure of the water vapor is 1.754. Okay, so now we use that 1.754 because we have it here. Now we look up the saturation temperature at this pressure, and you get 15.4 degrees Celsius. So if the surfaces of the windows are lower than that temperature, we're going to have uh, moisture on the inside surface. Okay. All right, human comfort in air conditioning. So this is a, a big thing, right? So, you know, we have to heat, cool, humidify, dehumidify. Um, the big thing that we have is, you know, humans generate heat and it depends on the activity right
right? So 87 watts it's showing when sleeping, okay, 115 when resting or doing office work, or 440 watts when doing uh, heavy physical work, okay? Um, so we reject body heat is in latent heat, while there's through convection and radi radiation is sensible. So we reject some of and through perspiration, so by sweating, so some is latent energy, others is sensible heat, okay? There's also the idea of a wind chill factor, maybe, I mean, hear more about it up north where I was from, Buffalo, New York, um, when you take into account the temperature plus the velocity of the wind, they basically, convert it to a wind chill factor because people do not feel temperature. We feel the heat dissipation. We feel the heat leaving our body, whether it's leaving the way, as much as we want it to or not, that's, how, that's what we feel. We feel the heat, we do not feel temperature, okay? So that's why it can be 75 degrees in your house or 72 in your house in the winter, and feel colder than 72 degrees in the house in the summer and feel hotter because you're also getting other heat transfers that are occurring, like radiation that you'll learn about in heat transfer class from the walls, okay? So the air itself is still the same temperature, okay? We're field heat dissipation. So that's why, you know, when we are, we work exercise, we feel hot because we're not getting rid of the heat fast. The temperature of the air still could be in the room, 72 degrees, but we're not dissipating our heat as much as we want to, so we feel warm, okay? So wind will play a factor in us feeling colder, even though the temperature is the same, right? Because it's removing heat from our body faster. All right, then, so, human comfort. So there's primarily three things that people like. There's a certain dry bulb temperature. So the temperature, think about the room that you just set your thermostat, the, time, it's the dry bulb temperature, right? There's a certain amount of relative humidity we like, right? There's also a certain amount of air motion, okay? So most people prefer 40 to 60% relative humidity, okay? They want you know, to have a certain amount of air motion to remove the moist air that builds up with fresh air. Okay. And I mentioned human comfort, heat transfer by radiation, body walls, windows. So where it can, again, where it can feel hot because you're standing by a window, even though the air temperature is 72 in your room, you're getting heat transfer from radiation from the sun. Like if you're standing out the window and the sun's blaring through the window, you're getting heat transfer to you from directly, even though the air around you is still 72 degrees um, Fahrenheit, you're, you're feeling that extra heat transfer and that you feel hotter then because of that, that, extra, that heat that's coming into you, not the temperature. All right. So that's why relative humidity is important, right? Some of those things. And then, all right, so let's take this to our conservation of mass and conservation of energy. So the big thing we do, right? Most of these things, we're gonna assume steady flow process, so steady state, okay? It's open system, okay? And the, Big thing we do, mass in is then equal to mass out, right? So if it's steady state, so then we just gotta take any of the masses in, they're equal to masses out. But what we do is we separate, we do a mass balance for the dry air, and we do a mass balance for the water vapor, okay? So this is very important, okay? Without doing this step right here, you can get a lot of these problems incorrectly, okay? And this is what I see people that don't completely understand chapter 14, just try to apply um, the earlier chapters to it, 
without doing the separation of dry air and water vapor. Okay. All right, so if we separate the dry air, so then we just basically have to look at the dry air coming in and out. Okay. Then we have to look at the water vapor coming in and out. Okay. And the simplification for the water vapor is if we know the specific humidity, it's this this ratio of water vapor, mass of water vapor, dry air, well, we rearrange it for the water vapor, it's just the specific humidity times mass of dry air. Well, we can put this in mass flow rates and then substitute this in for the mass flow rate of water, and that's what you have here. And that's what we'll do because this is, again, easier because dry air mass flow rate typically does not change the specific humidity of the water vapor will change. Okay, we might be humidifying or dehumidifying the air, adding water vapor, removing it. Okay, but in those processes, we're typically having the same amount of dry air, and that's not changing. Now, when we do our energy balance, we have our conservation energy at steady state, and we see we're neglecting, neglecting, kinetic energy and potential energy, right? We have our heat, work, and the enthalpy here. If you remember, we defined it. This enthalpy is kilojoules per kilogram dry air. But this kilojoules part includes dry air, and water vapor. Okay, it's this enthalpy we defined right here. So we only have one conservation energy, but we use the enthalpy per kilogram of dry air, so then all we need is that mass flow rate of dry air. All right, one extra derivation is the wet bulb temperature, okay? And it is basically a, a measurement of, we have to have methods of how do we measure humidity, right? We have to measure, get a relative humidity. How do we measure that, right? Usually we calculate a, we either measure a dew point, typically, temperature, or we measure a wet bulb temperature, and then from there, calculate a relative humidity. We don't typically measure relative humidity directly um, if we want a very accurate measurement. Okay, so how do we get that? So what it is, is this wet bulb temperature is, we don't know everything about this air coming in, okay? So we know the temperature, but we're trying to get information about its humidity, okay, at state one. So state one is where we don't know, basically, the specific humidity. We want information about it, but we don't know. We don't know what it is. Or, you know, if we have specific humidity, we can use relative humidity from the equation we defined way earlier you know, to get, we can go from specific to relative once we have one, of, one or the other, right? But we don't have, we don't know that air. So take the air in your room where you are right now. If you wanted to measure the, the humidity, right? So in this case, we don't, we know the temperature. That's easy to measure, just have a temperature sensor. So then we do need humidity. So what we do is we take that air and just put it through a little, you know, enclosure where we have water, lots and lots of water for it to pass through. That air gets passed through and it becomes saturated right here. So we make sure it's saturated and we create a saturated state at two. And, and that means we've created a state that is 100% relative humidity. So now we, we know the relative humidity of the outlet state. 
case, regardless of what that inlet state is, we have humidified the heck out of that thing, that air, and created a 100% relative humidity on the outlet. Okay, and that helps us. Okay, and we're adding water here at some at a at a temperature. Okay, so we now apply our equations: conservation of mass, while dry air coming in at one the same amount of dry air is leaving it too, right? We're only changing water vapor through this process. So mass of dry air one is equal to two, which is dry air. All right, water vapor though, we have some amount, we don't know what it is, coming in at one. We're adding some mass of, of liquid water here and we're exiting at two with the combination of that two amount of water vapor, right? Coming into one, we're adding this amount of mass of water in, and we're exiting it to some amount of water vapor. All right, so if we now, for the water vapor, insert that specific humidity, right, which is mass of vapor over mass of dry air. Okay, so we use that, and we stick for here and here, and that's what you see right here. And now rearrange for that mass that we're adding of water from this bottom, okay? And it ends up being this, okay? So we have the dry air mass flow rate and the difference in the specific humidities, from two minus one. All right, so now we apply the conservation energy. We have mass flow rate of dry air one and its enthalpy, right? Because again, this enthalpy includes the enthalpy of the dry air one and the enthalpy of the water vapor. We have exiting dry air and its enthalpy, which includes the enthalpy of the, the moist air there. And then we have this mass of water coming in and it's bringing in some enthalpy of that water. Okay, not water vapor, but it's putting in water right here, right? And so we have that conservation energy. We plug in this mass flow rate equation we already defined above for m dot s. So that's substituted right in here. Okay. Cancel basically out mass flow rate of dry air. It ends up canceling out of that whole equation. And now we have this equation right here, simplify by putting in equations that we defined earlier for enthalpy, okay, and rearrange for specific humidity at one. And we get an equation, well, I guess two equations, because we need to solve for this, we need to grab this one, this value to plug into here, okay. But this gets us, this, it's a lot of steps, right? But that's the equation to get this specific humidity at one if we just create this adiabatic saturator. We're just saturating the S outlet state two. And knowing that information, we can utilize it to solve for what that humidity is at one, that specific humidity. Okay, so this is basically a wet bulb temperature. So number state two is basically a wet bulb temperature. And we'll see that on the next slide. So this equation is just a lot of table lookups. It's really, you know, you have temperature one, two, one, two, CP that, I mean, specific humidity at two, you can get it with, you gotta do a table lookup, table, the you know, same value for the table lookup. You have to get at state one, at temperature one, HG, at temperature two, HF. So again, the psychometric chart will do this nice and easy, but equation is kind of a, a pain to use. You see all the variables and table lookups you have to do to solve for it that way. Okay, so this is a wet bulb temperature measurement then. So they're basically converting, what you see here is the adiabatic saturator. Having airflow across, we have this liquid water coming in, and we have this wick right here that the thermocouple is measuring, which is basically this T2, is the wet bulb temperature. So this is our temperature wet bulb, right? So that, 
T2 right here is that temperature wet bulb. Okay. All right, because you're you're creating a 100% saturated condition with that wick there, and that's a temperature measurement. So this is one way they, they do it, and I've done these measurements in the labs. Uh, you have airflow across. You have a fan basically blowing across. Usually you have it in an enclosure, but um, with a fan blowing across, and that measure that wet bulb temperature. The other way is this one is good for field measurements, is you basically uh, swing this around. So this this swings around. So you basically you know swing it around your head like a helicopter or whatever, and and basically rotate it at a certain velocity. You just make a number of revolutions per minute, and that gives that velocity past that wet wick that you basically moisten that wick, and then you rotate this around and you can get a measurement or at whatever location you're at. So this is your wet bulb, and you would have a dry bulb temperature right here. So you'd have dry bulb, wet bulb, and having those two temperatures is enough to get specific humidity, relative humidity, all that other information. Wet, uh, Dew point, all you would need is those two measurements. All right, so psychometric chart, all of those equations we just went through are all in one single chart, and that is the beauty of the psychometric chart. You might need to stare at it for a little while, make your eyes go cross, cross your eyes, and then uncross them, you know, pound your fists on the table, and then you go, ah, all right, now I get it. Okay, so because there's a lot of lines on it because you just all the properties we went through. Well, they're all on there and they can they're all related, right? So this is the nice way of of seeing the slope of the, of the lines because they're just showing you one line here. Um, we have specific humidity on the right. We have dry bulb temperature on the bottom, and basically all you need is two of these properties to fix a point, right? So if you had dry bulb in specific humidity, that would be a point, right? And that means you can grab wet bulb, you can grab enthalpy, you can grab relative humidity, you can grab specific volume. So all the other information. Or let's say you had relative humidity and dry bulb temperature. Right? You had dry bulb and you had relative humidity. That fixes your point. That means you could get specific humidity. You could get wet bulb temperature, right? So you can get enthalpy. So all these equations that we just went through are all on that psychometric chart. All right. This line right here is an important distinction is that is our set 100% percent relative humidity that's our saturation line if you start if you have a process that hits that line you're starting to condense out let's say we and we'll get to this but let's say we have a process that starts at this point and we go and hit that line in our process the only way our process can't go past the line we follow the line which means say we end up here which means our specific humidity just changed because we dropped out water Okay, because we're staying along that 100% relative humidity line and still cooling, that means water's condensing. You're, you're dehumidifying the water. Okay. The other thing that's important about important about this saturation line, that's what tells us the um, dew point temperature. Okay. So if we have we 15 degrees Celsius, the dew point temperature is basically the temperature which you hit that 100% saturation line, okay, on this on this chart, and we'll we'll go through how to grab all the values from the chart. We'll do an example with that. But that's where you hit that line. That's where the dry bulb, dew point, and wet bulb temperature are all the same. All right, the processes themselves and, and air conditioning processes, they follow along in those psychometric charts. So if you are doing a simple heating, 
right? Because this is your dew point, or your, sorry, dry bulb temperature. If you're increasing your dry bulb temperature, you're going from left to right along a horizontal line. If you're cooling, you're going from right to left, right? Because you're now decreasing in dry bulb temperature, so you go this way, okay? If you're straight humidifying, you go up, dehumidifying down, but typically, if you're humidifying or dehumidifying, you're doing like heating and humidifying or cooling and dehumidifying. Yeah, so air, we typically need to heat and humidify in the winter, cool and dehumidify in the summer. All right, so let's do some simple processes. We have simple heating and cooling, okay? So in a simple heating and cooling, so we see here, we just have air flow through a duct. You have air going through, okay? We're heating, we have some heating coils. Maybe it's a heat pump and your those are the coils in your um in your garage where that you have your I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but your air handler and you have the coils there uh of the the condenser and it's heating the air. Okay, and it's those coils, so it loops in basically chapter or chapter eleven. Those could be this could be the the condenser coils. All right. Or it could be just an electric heater, right? And we have air coming through, this moist air coming in at one, state one here, leaving at state two. All the dry air and the water vapor is not changing, right? We're not we're not condensing, we're not spraying in water. So the mass of dry air, when we do the conservation of mass, dry air at one is equal to dry air at two. So this should be subscript, but so we just have the mass of dry air, mass of the rate of dry air. Okay. When we do the water vapor, mass of rate of water vapor at one is equal to the mass rate of water vapor at two. So if we put in our specific humidity, which is the ratio of water vapor over air, right? Rearrange it. That means water the specific humidity at one, mass rate of air at one equals a specific humidity at two, mass rate of dry air at two. While we show that dry air is the same, this cancels, you're just left with the specific humidity at one and two being the same, okay? So that means you are just following a horizontal line in the psychometric chart. So if you're heating, you're going left to right. Here they're showing a simple cooling process in the psychometric chart. So even though we have heating over here, but this is showing cooling. So we're going from 30 degrees Celsius dry bulb at 12 degrees Celsius, so we're cooling. And we started at 30% relative humidity, so we have our point, right? And we know it's gonna be a horizontal line because it's, it's a simple cooling. Okay, so the specific humidity, which is this line right here that I drew that horizontal, is what's being shown. Okay, so Specific humidity is the same, so if we know the specific humidity is the same, we just end up there. Okay, so we would only need either 12 degrees Celsius or the relative humidity to get that point because we already know this is the same. But what you see when we cool, right, we drop the temperature, the specific humidity is the same, but the relative humidity changes, right, because we're changing temperature. So relative humidity is affected, right? I said it's relative to, to the temperature. And right? so even though we didn't change the amount of mass of water vapor in the air, our relative humidity changed from 30 to 80%. So it feels more humid, that air. All 
All right. So heating with humidification. So now we have state one right here. We have two right here, and then we have three. Okay. Well, with this one, we see we have a simple cooling from one to two. Okay, so, or sorry, simple heating from one to two. So our specific humidity stays the same. So just, this is the same process as what we saw over here from one to two. And the mass of dry air from one to two is the same, but it's also the same from two to three, even though we're spraying and humidifying right here. The, the mass flow to dry air does not change all the way from one, two to three. Okay, so we have the same mass of dry air. Okay. The, if we take this, they're showing just the process from one to two here, right? One to two, the specific humidity stays the same, just like on the last slide from one to two. Okay, the amount of heat from the coils, we do conservation energy. Again, the enthalpy has the enthalpy inside of it for the water vapor, even though we use just the mass flow to dry air there. Okay, so that enthalpy is the moist air contribution. So we have heat in, we have our mass flow rate enthalpy, mass flow rate enthalpy. We can solve for the amount of heat we need to provide from the heating coils. Okay. All right, from two to three. So now this section is if we just do the conservation of mass, we have the mass flow rate of dryers carrying in that. So this is the the water mass balance. So we have this amount of moist of, of water vapor coming in at two. We have a certain amount leaving at three. Okay. And then we're adding in some mass rate of water right here that we're spraying in. Okay, and we could solve for that just by rearranging. We have our mass flow to dry air and our difference in our specific humidity. Okay. So if we show this process on the psychrometric chart, okay, they just put some numbers to it. We're started off at 30% relative humidity, 10 degrees Celsius, so that gets us 0.1. We have our simple heating, so we have our horizontal line because the specific humidity is the same. And then we have our humidifying section. So we went, you know, they're typically spraying with hot, hotter water to humidify. So we, we end up up here. You know, they wanted 60% relative humidity, 25 degrees Celsius. So we ended up there. Yeah, this one's showing more of the values to it. So 10 and 30%. And then the exit, they only tell us it's 22 degrees Celsius. So we have that point, but we also know, right, that the specific humidity is the same. And then the outlet, we want 25 degrees Celsius, 60% relative humidity. So we know that point's gonna be there and we can solve for the mass flow rate of water that we have to inject right here. All right, so cooling, we already did a simple cooling, but this is cooling with dehumidification. So if you have a dehumidifier at your home, this is what it's doing, okay? Basically, you're cooling to the point that you hit the saturation line, okay? If you hit that curve, you're gonna start condensing out if you keep cooling, All right? You could just stop right there, but if you keep cooling and lowering the temperature below that, you're gonna start dropping out water and water condenses out. So that's what you see here. So we have one to two, okay? Give us temperature, relative humidity. So that means we have dry bulb, we have our point one. And then two is at 14, in 100% relative humidity. 
Okay, so we have the same mass of dry air, right? There's no dry air changing from one to two, so that's the same. We do our water mass balance. We have our amount of water vapor coming in at one. We have the moist air water vapor leaving at two, but then we're dropping out a certain amount of water vapor right here, or a certain amount of water right here. Okay, so if we solve, rearrange and solve for that, you see this equation here. Do our conservation energy. We have mass flow rate and enthalpy coming in, mass flow rate and enthalpy coming out, but we also have this mass flow rate and its enthalpy right here. Okay, so the, don't forget to include that if you're dropping out water. Right, if it was simple cooling, let's say from here to here, you wouldn't have any water vapor dropping out. So you would just have the change in enthalpy between one to two. But since we're hitting that 100% that relative humidity and we're still cooling, we follow that line. All right, evaporative cooling. Oh, that looks familiar, I think, maybe. All right, so evaporative cooling. Okay, so evaporative coolers or swamp coolers, right? Basically, as water evaporates, that latent heat of vaporization is absorbed from the water and that air, which makes the water and the air cool. Okay, so in this case, we have a porous jug you have this hot dry air coming in okay and that water evaporates into the air right in that to evaporate that water needs to take energy so it absorbs energy which drops the temperature okay in evaporative cooling is pretty much the adiabatic saturation process that we basically showed here. So it follows pretty much along the wet bulb line. Okay, so if you have hot, dry air, you're spraying in some water, you're going to follow along that wet bulb line to two. And you'll notice in, in the wet bulbs pretty constant and the enthalpy is pretty constant. The slope of those lines are pretty similar. So that's why we get to say the enthalpy is also pretty constant there. So here's an example of evaporative cooling with just a soaked head cover. So by soaking the head cover in water and putting it on your head, that's basically you're creating an evaporative cooler on your head. Okay, so so wrap their head and you know, a water-soaked cloth, so the pressure is one atmosphere, temperature is 120 degrees Fahrenheit, relative humidity is 10%. What's the temperature of this cloth? Well, it is, the wet bulb temperature is the same. Okay, so the, basically at 120 degrees Fahrenheit and 10% relative humidity, we just, you can use a psychometric chart since we're at one atmosphere. We just go and look and at those two hundred and twenty degrees Fahrenheit, ten percent relative humidity, we have a wet bulb temperature of seventy three point seven. So that is that cloth is at seventy three point seven degrees Fahrenheit, which is much cooler than that hundred and twenty degrees Fahrenheit, right? Here is just adiabatic mixing of air streams. And here you just have an air stream coming in one way, another, and they're mixing together to give you the outlet. So, um, you know, then the dry air, those two combine, the water vapor components of those two combine in the mixing section, 
and the conservation energy, those two combine to give you the outlet. Okay, if you rearrange and you actually see this on a psychometric chart, if you have state one here, state two, state three has to come somewhere along that line between them, right on the properties, because you're mixing two and three, so you have to, you're basically some portion between two and three at that point becomes. I'm saying it, HVAC process, you're taking a certain amount of fresh outside air and then some conditioned air from your air conditioner. So maybe stream, maybe this is your air conditioned air. And this is your fresh air. Okay. So you're mixing those two together to get that outlet. Okay. Another thing is wet cooling towers. Okay, here is, some of you have researched some of this for your projects, I saw. In your memos. Um, so, power plants. So those big towers you see, especially the ones that everyone thinks when they look at a nuclear power plant or the big towers that are not there anymore when you went over the big bridge to go to the airport. Um, those towers are not where exhaust is, that's just water vapor. Those were the cooling towers. They were essentially doing what you're seeing here, right? Or when people think of nuclear power plants, they think of those, they think of those cooling towers, which have nothing to do with a nuclear power plant and have everything to do with just the ranking cycle part of it. Um, it's the cooling towers. What you see coming from those are water vapor. The tiny stacks, columns are the stuff where you see the exhaust, the ones that don't look as, you know, as they're, as much as they're taking over the um, landscape of, of your view. That's the part that has the CO2 and stuff from it. So that's, um, that's the part that people kind of don't look at as much and they look at the bigger thing and think uh, that's it. But anyways, so what's happening in a cooling tower, right? We have we're basically doing a you know, type of evaporative cooling process. We're spraying water here. And we have air coming through. And this air comes up, comes through, and we get that cooling again of that latent energy as you have that spraying the water that latent energy cools the water that cools the air and, and and cools the water so you get this cooler water because of that and you have the airflow and you have this moist air coming out the top so there's actually you know you lose some water at the top but it's actually not that much you i mean you usually have to put in some makeup water but in this kind of process but it's usually you know, in a ranking cycle, they're wanting this water to go back, you know, and this is your evaporator or whatever that they want to then use this water for the cycle again. You're only, you know, you're using, losing maybe 5% of the water from evaporation, but you're getting a lot of cooling because there's a lot of energy and latent energy. All right, so we have, so this one has a fan, it's pulling air from down low up through it okay but others there's natural that drafting cooling tower which basically doesn't have a fan at all so the air comes in through here and it leaves through the top with moisture and believe it or not that air with moisture is lighter than the air when it's dry because water vapor when it's water vapor as a vapor water as a liquid isn't but water as a vapor is lighter than dry air okay water not water as a liquid right but water as a vapor because think of its um, molecular weight or molar mass is lighter okay so it creates this movement from bottom to top because this is heavier and then you add that water vapor to it, it becomes lighter and it creates this movement naturally. OK. 
methane. Another type of is a spray pond, so we can do sprays. So they're all using that latent energy. Okay. So here's kind of a, um, okay, that's the last one here. A diagram, kind of an example of this. We have, it looks more overwhelming than it is, but if we have our boundary around this, if we do our dry air, right? We're not changing dry air at all. We're coming in at one with dry air and we're leaving it at two, right? So it's all the water vapor stuff that's that's changing, okay? So dryer one to two is the same. Think of the water mass balance. We have, we're adding water three, okay, into our boundary, okay? Where we have some water vapor at, from one, and that's this component that's in the moist air. We're We have some water vapor at two, right here, in that moist air, okay? And then we have mass flow rate at four, right here, okay, leaving. All right, so if we rearrange this, and we have three minus four, so they're just rearranging what's coming in at three minus four, that's the makeup water, basically, how much is gonna be lost here, right? How much do we need to re-add from the water stream that we lost due to evaporation is the makeup water. Conservation energy, we have one with its enthalpy. We have moist, basically moist air in its enthalpy. We have the moist air in its enthalpy at two. And then three comes in with enthalpy and four leaves with its enthalpy of water. Okay and we can rearrange and utilize these equations to solve for the mass flow rate of dry air to do this problem. Okay. okay, so we went through and defined what dry and atmospheric air is. We looked at specific and relative humidity, dew point, adiabatic saturation, which is the wet bulb temperature, psychometric chart, and human comfort, air conditioning, and then the simple processes, okay? All right, so if I show you the psychometric chart real quick. So I have it up on on Canvas also, the just the PDFs of it, but it's also in your book, right? It's figure A31 for the SI units and A31E for the English units. Remember, I told you, you got to squint at it for a while. There's a lot of lines on it. And the key to all these figures, any of these charts that we have in the back of the book or any other ones, is find the labels and then work your way from the labels. Okay, so, so here I see this is relative humidity. So that tells me all these sloping lines that I follow up are relative humidity. If I find dry ball here, so that means these vertical lines are dry ball, okay? Humidity ratio. So the one thing they do is it's grams per kilograms of dry air. So it's the specific humidity, but they use uh, grams so they don't have to have all the decimal places. So the point here would be 0 0.002 kilograms of water per kilogram dry air. So they just make it grams to have the those numbers more legible. We have Enthalpy, again, this includes the enthalpy from the water vapor and the dry air, but it's per kilogram of dry air. And that's the sloping lines here, let's see. And then what else do we have? Wet bulb, it's a little tougher to read, but here's our, where it labels it. It's these tiny little dotted lines right here is our wet bulb temperatures. Okay, so we see a heat 25 here. There's 20, 15, 10, five. What else am I missing? Um, oh, here's a specific volume. So we're basically, if you needed density, right? If you wanted a velocity or rho VA, right? Mass flow rate, a 
equation. And you need density to get velocity and area or something like that. Here is that specific volume of the dry air. So here, you see this sloping lines right here, okay? So the useful ones that I mentioned with the in your project is the wet bulb temperature, right? So it said here, and then it said enthalpies in wet bulb are approximately constant during evaporative cooling. That's because you see the slope of the wet bulb temperatures here. It's very, very close to the slope of of the enthalpy, right? So if we took, let's say this 80, this is a nice easy one. 80 is this line that goes all the way from here and you see 80 over here. Well, you see this wet bulb right along it is your 26 line, but you see the dotted line is very close to just being 80. It crosses it, but it's approximately right on that line. Would it be possible for you to mark where you're talking about? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So here's 80, right? But I just, you see the dotted line right here. I'm pretty much over it too, but that's the wet bulb of here's 25. The dotted line would show is 26, is basically 26, but because we're right along that same slope, they're basically about the same slope, we can approximate the enthalpy and the wet bulb temperatures being the same, right? The relative humidity lines are these slopes. Right? We saw a specific volume was this one. So then we find our label and then we know that this is it here, here, here. Enthalpy is this and it goes all the way to over here. So we have that to that, that to that, right? And the specific humidity is this. So there's 10. Eight, and this is our horizontal line. So simple cooling, or simple cooling, simple heating, right? Here's our 100% relative humidity line. Okay. All right. So I'll leave it at that. Unless there's some other point you needed me. I think I got all the lines on here. I'd say again, the dry bulb's the toughest one to see. It's just that little dotted lines, right? But your label's 25, 20, 15, 10. So follow where the main label is and go from there for any of these lines. All right. Uh, we'll do an example, or not just one, but multiple examples next class on chapter 14. Is there any other questions? Yeah, so the psychrometric chart is, you know, when you have one atmosphere or you can approximate it as one atmosphere, maybe it's off just slightly, 101 kPa or 100 kPa, we can assume it's one atmosphere and use this chart. It, make, it means we don't have to use all those millions of equations I defined, right? Should also say I had to. I took an HVAC class in my undergrad, and my midterm was creating one of these these psychrometric charts from all those equations. That was what they had. It was a take home, but you had to create this chart from the equations of that I showed you all and create this chart there. So that was a fun one that I apparently never forgot. Right. All right. Whoa. Yeah. Um, so that's it for today. We'll, again, we'll do examples next class. All right. So I'll see you on, uh, Monday. All right. Thank you.